Hello interwebs and welcome to Nuance is a Thing, a series that I do on this channel every so often where I discuss the broad strokes of an important topical issue in or around the transgender and or LGBTQ community while also trying to be as empathetic, compassionate, and as open as I can be to all sides of the issue while still making my own personal stance clear. Because you guessed it, Nuance is a Thing! And I'll do it all with my trademark wit, irreverence, humor, and crippling, crippling self-doubt. But this brings us to the topic at hand, because I want to focus in on one of the biggest, most confusing, and controversial and incendiary issues when it comes to transgender topics. TERFs. And no, not like West Side Story turf war kind of turf, but trans exclusionary radical feminists. Almost every single trans person knows what TERFs are, but if you're outside of the trans community, you may be wondering why so many trans people are worried about musical gang warfare. But even within that, even if you have heard of TERFs, you may even be confused by what exactly they are. Yet, you've almost certainly heard of at least one of them, or at least someone who has been heavily connected to them. Harry Potter author and woman who loves to retcon her stories more than Voldemort clearly loves to snort cocaine, J.K. Rowling. I mean, look at the guy. Mean dope fiend. J.K. Rowling received a ton of blowback in 2020 for an essay she wrote called Turf Wars that many deemed transphobic, and which espoused a lot of the same issues of TERFs. Some even went on to say that it was the most harmful piece of writing she has ever been involved in, which is saying something because she was involved in The Cursed Child. But also confusingly, for many of those who may not know a lot about transgender issues, at the exact same time, many others argued that J.K. Rowling's essay wasn't transphobic at all. In fact, some even argued that it was supportive of trans people. Hell, she even won an award for that essay. Even within the essay itself, J.K. Rowling said she supported some trans people. She even has a transgender friend, as she says. Now, how can that be? How can the essay be argued to be both supportive and against a community? Well, watch the dang video. That's what I'm explaining right now. You just want to rush to the end. You're skipping all the cool stuff. I want to do, there's going to be costumes and everything. I do lighting stuff. But J.K. Rowling shows the complicated narrative of TERF's and TERF's line of thought because TERF arguments purport to be a form of and uses the language of feminism and can easily be obfuscated as well-meaning, even so much so that many who espouse it may sometimes believe they are trying to be helpful to transgender people and women as a whole. You see, TERFs, or as they often call themselves, gender-critical feminists, are hard to explain because they actually start from a very understandable point of view about gender, womanhood, and feminism that I think many of us agree on, including trans people and other feminists. And they're able to frame those arguments from those points of view so that those who don't have a deep understanding of feminism and gender theory, which, let's be honest, most people don't have because they don't spend their evenings like me rereading Julia Serrano's Whipping Girl every night because I want to die horribly alone like a good, good feminist. Uh, anyways, because of that, it allows folks who don't have that knowledge to look at their arguments and say, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense to me. But the issue is that while TERFs start from a logical basis that even many transgender folks agree upon, when put in practice or looked into deeply, their views are warped and then wielded, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally, as a relentlessly dogmatic and organized movement against the already marginalized transgender community rather than as what they purport to be, an earnest desire to achieve what it is argued it actually is aiming for, a world where all people, regardless of gender, as well as any other identities, have equal rights and liberties. Because in reality, turf beliefs not only harm trans people, but all women and many others beyond that, even if they don't realize it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The goal of this discussion is to try and give you an overview of all the views of TERFs, why their views are so insidious, and why they are harmful to trans people and even themselves, and why they believe what they do, as well as provide avenues for more ways that we can move forward. And that will be mostly through things that you can look up down in the down below, which will go into further discussions and issues. This video will be a generalization that touches upon the basics, that just gives you a place to start, so you have the tools to understand, critically analyze, and push back against TERF ideology where you see it. But to paraphrase a man who only had sex once every seven years, this is meant to be the beginning of wisdom, not the end. And I'll be providing some additional resources, as I said, down below. Then also being said, I am going to be summarizing some complicated philosophy in order to have this discussion, because by this very nature, this discussion on TERFs is rooted in complex gender philosophy. Gender is confusing, and it's okay to get lost. We're going to walk through this together, so feel free to go back and rewatch. I, like I said, Gonna have some cool costume, it's gonna be fun, and as I said, I'll have further resources down below to help break down each part of the discussion if you get confused and want sort of like more deeper dives into stuff. 
And one final thing before we get into the topic, as I said before, this is going to be that generalization. There are always within any group, regardless of if I'm talking about TERFs or trans people or anyone else, going to be differences, opinion and thought and different ways in which these things show up. Not everything that I'm going to be discussing is going to be simply clear cut in the real world, but these are just the basic trends that I see when we talk about TERFs. Also, before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, hit the like button, and if you want to support me and get yourself cool perks like your name in videos, please consider giving on my Patreon page. I'm trying to do this job full time one day um, and to be able to have more time to do in-depth video essays like this. So if you want to support me doing that, Patreon is the best place to do it. So with that said, let's cue the transition. Get it? Transition? Oh God. This is, this is starting off well. When we talk about trans exclusionary radical feminists, most people understandably focus on the trans exclusionary part. I mean, that's what's getting all the press. But to really get to the heart of why TERFs are harmful, we need to begin with the ERF part of the TERFs, radical feminism. Radical feminism comes out of second wave feminism. Thankfully, this isn't a bunch of feminists that want to go surfing because no one wants to see me smack into a wave for hours, or maybe you do. I'm not really uh, sure what content you're here on YouTube for. I probably have failed at it. But for context though, today we are currently in what is generally considered to be fourth wave feminism. The first wave of feminism occurred during the end of the 19th century into the early 20th century, focusing on women's voting rights. The second wave of femi feminism Feminism. Second wave feminism began when women started to gain financial independence after many men left to go join the army during World War II, so women had to join the workforce and started to go, Oh, hey, we kind of like not being stuck at home all the time. That seems pretty neat. And this led to a huge explosion of discussions on issues facing women, like rape culture, the sexual objectification of women, child custody, economic independence, right to bodily autonomy, and which bras burnt best. Surprisingly, it was Victoria's Secret bras. That's her secret. But as feminism as a movement began to grow, it began to splinter into different groups that had different goals, methods, and issues that they focused on. Think eco-feminists or Marxist feminists or whatever Doug's sister Judy was. And radical feminists were one of these groups. To oversimplify, radical feminists, like most feminists, argue that most modern civilizations are patriarchal in nature, societies which men dominate and women are oppressed, either actively or passively. In such societies, men, both explicitly and implicitly, are believed to be socially, physically, politically, economically, and mentally superior, and are often given more access to things like higher powerful positions, higher paying jobs, education access, and more. And women, as well as any other identity such as non-binary folks, are often subject to more harassment and violence, and have less control over their economic and bodily autonomy. Men are expected to be dominant and women submissive, for example. And this patriarchal society framework generally frames men as the oppressing group and women as the oppressed. And to state the obvious, by the way, because this is sadly social media and it requires me to be overt, this is not saying that all men are misogynist pigs who hate women. Some can be, we've all seen the Ferengi, but I will not stand here and be spoken to by a female. Nor is it saying that every single man always benefits from the general oppression of women in these societies, but that the relationship between men and women is central to patriarchal societies and that it is defined by oppression and power dynamics. That society has built systems and overriding ideology that holds men at the head of power structures, and that this belief often gets reflected in individual interactions between genders as well. But this idea of the patriarchy is not exclusive to radical feminism, but all, most fem, all, most kind of some feminist theories. So, big takeaway of this section though is in patriarchies, men are oppressors, women oppressed. Radical feminists, however, focus in on that power dynamic of men being part of the oppressing class and women being the oppressed. That this structure leads to men being able to have more say in agencies in women's bodies than women do in their own bodies. And I'm not just talking about things like abortion or contraception, by the way, access to those things as well, but where women's bodies are allowed to be, like in high paying jobs or just access to certain spaces, or who gets to have agency in things like sex, for example, who gets to decide whose pleasure is more important during those acts. It's down to the idea that men have more power and agency and right to a woman's body than a woman does to her own. And radical feminism focuses on how this general power structure gets established through the concept of gender. 
We all get assigned a gender at birth, most often a masculine or feminine gender, man or woman. And we assign these genders based on the genitals that you're born with. If you're born with a penis, you'll be a man in this society. If you're born with a vagina, you'll be assigned a woman at birth. And if you're born intersex, well, someone, probably your doctor or parents, will pick a gender for you of those two and probably, sadly, give you a surgery that you did not consent to to make you appear to have one or the other type of genitalia which is, uh, not awesome. But I think we can all agree on this, yes? That if you're born with a penis, people will tell you that you're a man, that you have that big, strong penis energy. Yeah, fuck everything. Yeah, quite literally. And if you're born with a vagina, people will say, that there's a pretty lady. We're all on the same page here, right? So let's just take a minute and breathe in and out and just enjoy this moment where we all agree. Now is going to come the part where we're not all gonna agree, and it's gonna get a wee bit contentious. So, if we understand this general idea that men are oppressors and women are oppressed in a patriarchal society, and we also accept the idea that we choose if someone is which gender at birth based on their genitals, then it's pretty clear that genitals play a huge role in if someone is placed in the oppressed or oppressing class at birth that someone's genitals at birth will heavily influence whether they are grouped into an oppressing or oppressed class and which privileges they are given access to or denied. And it would make sense that if you view things this way, as radical feminists do, then the goal should be to try to stop society from defining people's access to rights based on genitals. As radical feminist Shulamith Firestone wrote in 1970, the end goal of feminist revolution must be, unlike that of the first feminist movement, not just the elimination of male privilege, but of sex distinction itself. Genital differences between human beings would no longer matter culturally. So yeah, I think we all generally agree that your junk is a big deal. Like, a really, really big deal. And while we all agree on that, the question that some people have, like trans people, is... Is it actually the biggest deal, though? You see, while we all agree that genitals determine your gender at birth, people argue over how gender assignment relates to how we experience gender in our societies, as a social construct, or if it's inherent in our bodies. The body side of the argument is the one that seems to make the most common sense to many of us, right? That if you're born with certain biological markers like chromosomes, XX or XY, then it determines what types of characteristics that you are given and what genitals you have. But is that the end of it? Because, and we all know, and trans people agree with this by the way, no trans person is arguing against this, though TERFs will say that we are, that biology determines certain aspects of our physical makeup. Like, like I said, genitals most typically is thought of having a penis or a vagina, but also could be things like getting boobs when you're younger, or broad shoulders, or different things that you experience when you go through puberty. But, do those biological markers determine our gender? Yes, they may determine certain sex characteristics, but gender might be something different. Because we talked about before gender being discussion of how we are treated by society as a boy or girl, which group that we are placed into. The idea of the social construct of gender gets confusing for many people, so let's use a day-to-day -day example to sort of highlight this idea. Let's say you're out on the street and walking by somebody and you see a person. You look at this person, how do you know what gender they are? They're wearing a dress, makeup, have cleavage showing, but they have broad shoulders, maybe. What do you think that their gender would be? I assume most of you would say... Girl. But why did you assume that person's gender was woman? Is it because you knew what was in their pants? And I ask this question sincerely, are you 100% certain of what their genitals were? Have you seen their genitals? You might assume that they have a vagina, and you might be correct, but you don't know that for sure. No, you 100% don't. What if that person was transgender and hasn't had any surgery or didn't want to have surgery, or what if they were intersex? But you still treated this person as a woman based on your quick interaction with them. Well, why would you do that? Well, either A, they told you that they were a woman, which is what we should all be doing. We should all be, you know, asking a person what they are before assuming that. Or B, at the very least, you l assumed what they were based on how they looked. Now, this person may have been born with a vagina, as I said, and took on a woman's gender at birth since then and has always identified as a woman. But in your interaction on the street, your treatment of her as a woman had nothing to do with what you knew about what she was assigned at birth. And you had nothing to do with her genitals. 
So when a woman is treated as a woman by you or by society at all, it's not because of genitals. I mean, at least I hope not. Butch-looking women, for example, have described a similar phenomenon in how we socialize gender. Many masculine-presenting women are often mistaken for men, describing being yelled at for going into the women's bathroom. Even though they were born assigned a woman at birth, were born with vaginas, still have vaginas as far as we know, and still define as a woman, they still get thought of as a man because of certain signifiers that code them as more masculine. Even one of my favorite comedians of all time, Tignan Taro, has described this phenomenon of being mistaken for a man. On the sidewalk, I was passing this guy, Right when we were passing each other, he said to me, right when we were passing each other, he said, ah, them a little titties. <laughs> I, th I, th I thought you was a man. <laughs> now, to be fair, I just assume her gender is Jet Reno from Star Trek Discovery. I mean, engineering's a gender, right? I mean, it's definitely dealing with plumbing, if you know what I mean. But this is what we typically mean when we're talking about the social construct of gender. We're not ignoring biology. We're just talking about that we typically treat each other based on a mixture of cues, from our physical body, to how we present ourselves, to our expressions of uh, clothing or voice, to things like pronouns and how we like to be referred to. Gender is built on all of these things, of which biology and physical characteristics certainly do play a part, especially in what gender that you are assigned at birth and what you may feel most comfortable with, uh, you know, believing that you are, but it's more than if someone has a penis or a vagina. Basically, trans women are just saying what philosopher Shania Twain told us all those years ago. Hot damn, I feel like a woman. Ba na 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 na. And so when a trans person comes out and decides to transition, we're typically working to try and change aspects of ourselves, either through physical things like hormones or surgery or things like that, to social things like in how we dress or what pronouns we use. But at the end of the day though, we're just individuals and gender is seen in a multitude of ways. Gender is just one way of expressing oneself through certain aspects in our society. And some are harder to change than others, like genitals for example can be changed through surgery but that takes a lot of money, time, and effort. and access as well. But we do have the capability to change them. But smaller things like social cues, like what outfits you wear and things like that, are easily changeable. And trans people are just trying to find a way in our gender to make ourselves feel more comfortable. How we express ourselves through our body and through our, you know, outward features with how we express ourselves in things like clothing and pronouns and usage like that is just one way that we are working to make ourselves more comfortable. Instead of either the anxiety or ambivalence that we have to go through in our daily lives with our bodily features that we were born with that make us uncomfortable or the social roles that we were told to play because of those bodily features. But if we understand gender as a social construct, that means those seen as women, regardless of what genitals they have, are oppressed. That trans women and cis women are still harmed because they are women. Nothing to do necessarily with our genitals. Now, knowing is saying that trans and cis women face the exact same kinds of harm. For example, cis women have to fight for access for their bodily autonomy rights to things like abortions or things like that, while trans women have to fight for things like gender-affirming surgeries. These are two distinctly different fights with two distinctly different communities. But both trans and cis women also face very similar fights because we are women. We face higher rates of sexual abuse, discrimination in the workplace, and even more because we are women. And trans people, men, women, or non-binary, will also face added challenges because we are trans, like extra laws that relegate trans bodies. But bringing this back to the trans-exclusionary radical feminist discussion, remember those words of the famed radical feminist Julia Myth Firestone that I said earlier? Well, that last bit of her quote is important to note here. Genital differences between human beings would no longer matter culturally. The goal of radical feminists is that they want to eliminate the concept of gender as they see it as a tool to create social hierarchies like the patriarchy, which oppresses those who are assigned a gender of woman or something other outside of man at birth, something that is typically assigned to us, as we said, based on our genitals at birth. But TERFs are a subset of radical feminism that fundamentally misunderstands this point. And I want to say this up front, that not all radical feminists are trans-exclusionary, the T part of the equation. TERFs are people who oppose the self-definition of transgender people and gender as a social construct, and who root their feminism and their view of gender and that view of the oppression of women specifically in bodies. They don't see gender as a social construct, but that if you're born with a penis, you're a man, and if you're born with a vagina, you're a woman, no matter what. Nothing can change that period end of statement. Even if you look like a woman, were treated like a woman by everyone else in society, no matter what, you are a man if you were born with a penis. 
and for intersex folks who may have been born with ambiguous genitalia or both are generally left out of their discussions completely or whenever they are discussed they are discussed with whatever sex they were forced to assign with at birth. And so already we see the tension between the transgender community and TERFs. If trans people see gender as a social construct with there being women, man, and non-binary genders and men can be trans or cis, TERFs see gender this way that there are men and trans women are a form of man, and that there are women and trans men are a form of that. But in many ways, this sort of structure isn't all that dissimilar to any person who opposes transgender self-identification says about transgender person. What separates TERFs though more is how they have fundamentally misunderstood that radical feminist idea and larger feminist ideals of the patriarchy. Talk about that power structure of men and women as oppressing and oppressed classes. We can't talk about how women are harmed without that. But for TERFs, they have essentialized genitals and bodies as the determining factor of this worldview. And because they state that trans women are men, they focus on that fact and state that all trans women are oppressors, and trans men are solely victims of the patriarchy, have no agency in their own choices. But that gets us to our next topic. TERF's dogmatic focus on this idea that trans women are oppressors and predators and trans men are victims without agency is what lies at the root of their harm. It's not that they see the power structure system of men and oppressors and women as oppressed. It's that they see trans people as active, harmful agents in this fight. As if trans women specifically, who they see as their male oppressors, are directly trying to attack cisgender women by virtue of their being trans. And as a result, TERFs frame everything about transgender people in this active attacking and fear-mongering way. All transsexuals rape women's bodies by reducing the real female form to an artifact, appropriating this body for themselves. However, the transsexually constructed lesbian feminist violates women's sexuality and spirit as well. Rape, although it is usually done by force, can also be accomplished by deception. TERFs say things like, trans women are men and all men are rapists, therefore all trans women are rapists. I am so glad that TERFs understand the basic idea of math and the transitive property, but uh, we're talking about a different type of trans. Maybe that's where they got things confused. One of the ways that they frame their fear-mongering tactics is that they argue that trans women are just men pretending to be women to invade women's faces and harm women. We see this, for example, in one J.K. Rowling's essay, excuse me, Robert Galbraith's essay, where she espoused and supported the turf viewpoint and argument that allowing trans women into women's restrooms will let men pretend to be women in order to get into the women's restroom and rape them. When you throw open the doors of bathrooms and changing rooms to any man who believes or feels he's a woman, and, as I've said, Gender confirmation certificates may now be granted without any need for surgery or hormones. Then you open the door to any and all men who wish to come inside. That is the simple truth. Not sure why I expected any better from a woman who wrote a whole story about a giant snake hiding in a girl's bathroom. I am not saying that I don't understand this fear. I most certainly do. I can and have felt as a woman what it's like to be afraid of being assaulted, especially in a place that's supposed to be safe. It's like a horror movie, this idea that the safest place to be, the place where you allow yourself to be your most vulnerable, is the place where you're going to be attacked. But let me be clear. Clear? Suddenly became Irish here. But let me be clear. No matter what rights you give to women, assault and abuse will still be and always have been illegal. If, for example, a man does claim to be a trans woman and enters a bathroom and assaults a woman, that is a thing that can be prosecuted criminally. But on top of all of that, there have been no recorded cases of trans women assaulting people and women in the bathroom. So to deny trans people access to just using the bathroom in a public space is just attacking trans people to attack trans people. And using this fear-mongering tactic about men invading women's spaces is not only flat-out lies, but expressly transphobic. It turns many trans women into Freddy Krueger to many TERFs. Though in actuality it turns out that we're just Freddy Krueger's mom. 
Actually, sorry, that's a bad metaphor. Both trans and Swiss women are like Alice in Friday the 13th. We're the ones that are being attacked by the, you know, awful person trying to kill them. We're like all the camp counselors. The, wait, does that mean that we're gonna get killed in the sequel? Look, this metaphor is falling apart after a point. Just know that we're not in sleepaway camp. In fact, both trans women and cis women face increased rates of sexual assault in our society anywhere, not just in the bathroom. Trans women are just as open to abuse as cis women. In fact, they often face more abuse because we are trans. Yet by arguing differently, by putting transgender women's bodily autonomy underneath cisgender women's bodily autonomy, they are subtly denying trans women humanities over cis women's. So, I want trans women to be safe. At the same time, I do not want to make natal girls and women less safe. And TERFs repeatedly use fear-mongering tactics in many ways, often pointing to cases like Karen White's, for example, who was put into a men's prison for sexual assault, then came out as a trans woman and was transferred to a woman's prison. While there, she allegedly raped several fellow prisoners. White's actions, if they did happen as they are alleged to, are awful. But White's actions are not representative of all trans women. Every group is going to have some awful people in it. She was one woman who did a horrible thing. Thing. But these stereotypes and marginal cases are wielded against the transgender community by TERFs to characterize all TERFs this way. It also ignores the fact that trans women placed in men's prison have a much higher rate of being sexually assaulted there than in if they were put into a women's prison. But again, framing trans women's bodies is less important than cis women's. But TERFs will often argue that they aren't trans exclusionary at all because they accept trans men. Yet, they only view trans men as victims of the patriarchy, having been brainwashed by society into hating their own womanhood and wanting to transition to be a man to escape their self-hatred. Again, J.K. Rowling, who basically went through an entire TERF's treatise in her essay, stated something similar in this. The writings of young trans men reveal a group of notably sensitive and clever people. The more of their accounts of gender dysphoria I've read, with their insightful descriptions of anxiety, dissociation, eating disorders, self-harm, and self-hatred, the more I've wondered whether, if I'd been born 30 years later, I too might have tried to transition. The allure of escaping womanhood would have been huge. I struggled with severe OCD as a teenager. If I'd found community and sympathy online that I couldn't find in my immediate environment, I believe I could have been persuaded to turn myself into the son my father had openly said he'd have preferred. TERFs argue that trans women, like I said, hate their womanhood and want to not be oppressed anymore, so they try to reach out into the male patriarchy and gain privilege and power that way. But by framing trans men this way, they paradoxically are taking agency away from trans men. Something that is expressly not a feminist thing. Not at all. Not even the least bit. It gets zero percent feminism. The women in our coalition choose to set aside their differences and work together after we saw firsthand the deeply negative and downright dangerous consequences of ignoring bodily sex. We watched as doctors enable the irreversible damage to our daughters' bodies. We sat stunned as boys took away our sister sports opportunities, and we wept as our lesbian friends poisoned their bodies with with testosterone in an attempt to appear male. TERFs feel a sense of ownership over trans men. Again, they're putting their own bodily autonomy over someone else's. Take, for example, the recent coming out of actor Elliot Page. When Elliot Page came out as trans, even though he had publicly been known as a lesbian before then, TERFs described that they were losing one of their lesbians to the transgender community. But Elliot does not belong to TERFs, nor the entirety of the lesbian community, or neither to the transgender community that he is now openly a part of. While I appreciate his activism for the LGBT community as a whole, the only obligation that Elliot has is to himself. To lead a life that makes him happiest, not a life beholden to others' desires to have him in their community. As a trans man, I am and always will be belittled, disrespected, spoken down to, and patronized by transphobes. 
After all, they think I have been brainwashed and fooled into thinking I'm a man. What could I possibly know? What value could my words or experience possibly have? This is, again, anti-feminist. The idea that trans men are just foolish women whose words cannot have any value is deeply troubling and mirrors patriarchal behaviors towards silly girls, no matter how old or accomplished the women in question actually are. So, as we can see, TERFs don't support trans men. Instead, they view trans men as objects, Pokemon cards worth collecting. It goes against the very idea of radical feminism, that all folks, women, men, whoever, have the right to have agency in their own body and life. My accent has really changed throughout this entire segment. And non-binary folks in this discussion, it is worth mentioning, are either entirely ignored, treated as their birth sex, or argued that they are just attention seekers rather than legitimately trying to be our authentic selves. It should also be mentioned, though I am not the best person to discuss this, that TERFs also typically focus exclusively on the concerns of white, upper-middle-class women, failing to include the harm that faces black women for their being black, or understanding how class or economic issues affect gender as well, and power dynamics within our society, often disregarding issues like those of lower economic means being able to afford access to abortions, for example. So why does this all matter? Why do we need to discuss TERFs at all? Obviously we can see problems with their argumentation, but why are they such a big deal? Why does everyone keep discussing them? Well, it's because they are listened to and they can be extremely harmful, even to themselves. TERFs focus their activism and actions on attacking trans women's rights specifically. And this isn't supposition, that is their direct goal. Janice G. Raymond wrote in her 1989 book, The Transsexual Empire, one of the foundational texts for modern TERFs beliefs, The problem with transsexualism would best be served by mandating it out of existence. I believe that the elimination of transsexualism is not best achieved by legislations prohibiting transsexual treatments and surgery, but rather by legislation that limits it. You see, right at one of the main documents of their line of thought, the main goal that is spelled out for them wasn't just an intellectual one, it's not just one for the discourse, but they actually had clear political goals and outcomes. The intention of TERFs is not just to fight an ideological battle, but to have actual real-world ramifications for transgender people's daily lives. TERFs have long existed in feminist spaces, even before the term TERF came into common usage in the early 2000s. In 1973, for example, Beth Elliott, a trans woman, was going to perform with her band at the 1973 West Coast Lesbian Feminist Conference. But she was protested both before and during her performance because she was a trans woman invading a women's only space. Gender critical groups throughout the 1970s threatened violence against trans women. The Michigan Women Folk Festival, a well-known women-only festival, refused to allow trans women to attend it until it ended in 2015. However, TERFs today have taken a slightly different and much more harmful form. First and foremost, TERFs are incredibly active in social media spaces like Twitter, Tumblr, and formerly on Reddit. According to researchers who study posts about trans people on social media platforms in the US and UK, up to 15% of posts about transgender people are actively abusive and anti-transgender online. On video streaming sites like YouTube, this one, the one that we're on right here, 78% of such discussions about trans people were abusive. 78%. And a lot of this hatred is generated from TERFs. For example, when trans woman and professor Grace Lavery posted an article about TERFs online, quote, It led to a massive explosion of online harassment, which I just didn't see coming at all. People in the seemingly hundreds started trying to find me and just write insulting things about me. And that escalated to the degree that it was totally out of control. At one point, people were posting the names and contact details and photographs, not only of me, but of my colleagues at UC Berkeley, online. This sort of online harassment can lead to mental health issues for many transgender folks who engage online. And considering that we all live in an online world now because we're all isolated and alone because of a pandemic, we all have to be online. 
but we constantly have to face regular abuse just for being trans in an online space. I, as a trans woman on YouTube, can sadly attest to this on a personal level, but I won't talk about that much here, I've talked about it in other videos. But outside of online spaces, in the real world, TERFs actively work to try to dehumanize transgender people and work to push anti-transgender legislation. To name just a few examples, Sheila Jeffries went before the UK Parliament in March 2018 to declare that trans women were parasites, dehumanizing language that frames transgender people as less than, as inhuman, in an effort to push anti-transgender legislation in the UK. The gender critical group the Women's Liberation Front petitioned the US Supreme Court in the US in the case of Harris Funeral Homes vs. EEOC and Amy Stevens, where trans woman A.E. Stevens was fired for being transgendered. TERFs also, for example, recently helped back the court case of Korea Bell in the United Kingdom, which is currently led, as the time of this video, to effectively a ban on 16-year-olds being given access to puberty blockers across the United Kingdom, an essential and life-saving treatment that could help many young trans teens. And I've done a video on that already that you can check out at, up here somewhere. TERF's words, like those by J.K. Rowling, have also been cited by many lawmakers making anti-transgender legislation in the U.S. and the U.K. There have been several studies that have proven this fact that show that things like J.K. Rowling's words have had actual demonstrable and demonstrable uh, effects on anti-transgender legislation. Uh, legislation? Why can I not speak? Anti-transgender legislation. Books that espouse TERP ideology like Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage have gotten placed on bookshelves at places like Target, one of the biggest retailers in the United States, showing the normalization that these views have gotten in recent years. TERFs are also getting more and more money and financial backing as well, such as when the popular vegan cosmetic company Lush donated 3,000 pounds to the anti-trans organization Women's Place UK. TERFs have also been gaining more power in places like the United Kingdom. In UK academia, for example, TERFs have become the de facto voice of feminism. In Britain, TERFs have effectively succeeded in framing the question of trans rights entirely around their own concerns. That is, how these rights for others could contribute to female erasure. Many prominent figures in British journalism and politics have been made TERFs. British TV has made a sport of endlessly hosting their lurid rudeness and styling it as courage. British newspapers seemingly never tire of broadsides against the menace of gender ideology. But this also highlights another problem that we see with terse viewpoints, that they are more interested in attacking trans women than they are in actually helping women's causes. For TERFs, attacking a trans person was more important than general women's rights. It's all about attacking trans people. That's their first and foremost goal. It is their express goal. In January 2019, for example, the Conservative Heritage Foundation held an event that prominently featured many members of the WOLF to discuss opposition to transgender ideology. You might be thinking to yourself, why is a lesbian speaking to the Heritage Foundation? And I asked myself the same thing. Keep in mind that the Heritage Foundation is a conservative group in the United States that has actively worked to limit women's rights. So they are more willing to work with the Heritage Foundation than trans people. WOLF's unique focus as an organization is on gender identity policies and legislation. Given this focus, our resources and the current climate of the American political left, we have found working with conservative organizations or individuals to often be an effective tactic towards advancing our policy goals for women. We reject the notion that we should be ashamed or should refuse support from people on critical issues just because they are our opponents in other areas. One gender critical group hands across the aisle was founded by Kaylee Triller Haver, an anti-abortion conservative. Many tourists have also appeared on Fox News, a right-wing uh, news organization in the United States, to espouse anti-trans rhetoric. But why do they do this? Why do they work against their own self-interest with these groups? And why are they so expressively and dogmatically focused on attacking trans people? So I've basically given an overview of TERF beliefs, but I want to end our discussion before wrapping out on the big question. Why? Why do they believe this? Why do they focus so much on transgender people? Well, let's look at what TERFs say about what makes transgender people so harmful. First, they argue that transgender people reinforce stereotypes of womanhood. A claim to gender identity is a claim that everyone else must stay in their sex-based boxes, but you get to pick yours, and all these other more boring people must go along with it. 
that by wanting to be women, by putting on the aspects of womanhood, transgender people are somehow reinforcing what a woman has to be, that a woman has to be this way, that they have to be hyper feminine and girly and all these things. There's nothing wrong with being that, but I hope I've shown in this video that trans people can express a variety of womanhood. We don't just pigeonhole ourselves into one type of womanhood, but many womanhoods. Womanhood is just one way that we all express ourselves, not just trans women, but any woman. But this also goes back to the idea of radical feminism, that gender is just a made up social thing that is used to perpetuate the patriarchy. In fact, I would say that I as a trans woman am a radical feminist. I am critical of the idea of gender. But that's a larger fight that acknowledging that trans women are women does not exclude you from discussing. We sadly live in a world where gender does exist. Would I like to completely eliminate that idea of gender to get rid of it and just allow people to exist as themselves? Yes, but that's a big project for me to take on. But at the end of the day, today, I'm just being me. And who I am today happens to align more with the gender of womanhood right now. And so I express myself in that way and society reads me as a woman and generally treats me as a woman when they read me as a woman. But that doesn't dismiss the ideas of facing womanhood or that you have to pigeonhole trans women as sort of reinforcing this idea of womanhood because as I showed we can express a variety of different types of womanhood and transgender people aren't reinforcing this idea but are just expressing our own personal selves. But jumping off of that, TERFs argue that discussions of transgender people erase women's ability to talk about biological issues that face cis women, that face women born with a uterus. That for example we won't be able to talk about abortion access for women and things like that if we only talk about women and gender as a social construct because it's just there to help the transes. I find this idea incredibly ridiculous. As if discussing one type of woman means that we can't have any other conversations about any other women. It's constantly this argument we get into in a lot of different things that there's only one argument that we can make at a time. No, humanity is a varied different species with many, many people that can have many, many different conversations at once and fight for many different things at once. And you don't have to define ourselves by one conversation. So being able to acknowledge trans people and the issue that trans people face and the issue that trans women face specifically doesn't override the fact that women as a group, trans or not, often face other issues as well, and that cis women also face their own challenges that are separate from trans women. But TERFs often argue bad faith that trans women are trying to erase this idea of that we can fight for womanhood. Take JK Rowling making fun of this article saying people with uteruses instead of saying women, for example. But like, that article was talking about uteruses and access to healthcare. Like, the conversation about issues that face women with uteruses is being had in that article. So the conversation is clearly going on. Similarly, TERFs also like to argue that this issue around transgender people is a free speech issue. That by, quote, forcing people to talk about transgender people as women instead of saying that they're men and saying that people who are misgendering trans people as men are being harmful is denying people's access to free speech. Number one, I've already spoken about how misgendering someone can cause transgender people mental health harm. So you are being directly harmful whether you intend it or not when you misgender someone. But also, no one's demanding in your everyday life that you are forced to talk about trans people in a specific way. Take, for example, again, JK Rowling making fun of the fact that the article was saying uterus havers. And also just saying people with uteruses is just accurate? You don't have to engage with that article. Also, it's a scientific article talking about people with uteruses. That it, it, it's just a term. I don't go around every day talking to other women being like, hello, uterus haver. It's like, no, when you're in a scientific article talking about uteruses, you're going to talk about uteruses. And then in everyday society and conversation, we can talk about women. We can have these conversations. We don't have to erase trans people, nor does it erase women being women and described as women. And also, trans women never argue that we are exactly like cis women. There are many aspects of typical cis womanhood that I and other trans women will never experience. I will never have to worry about my access to birth control or abortions or doctors who understand a cis woman's body. I was not socialized from birth as a woman to take up as little space as possible, to look pretty, to accept being fetishized by men. All of these things and more will never be part of my experiences of trans womanhood. But I and other trans women have, and trans people in general have never denied that. So to say that is just bad faith argumentation against trans people, putting up a straw man version of us instead of actually engaging with what we're really saying and presenting that to other people as if that's what trans people are actually are. But turfs say that having a uterus, having a vagina is the only way to have access to womanhood. That to have a period makes you a woman. But what about women who are born infertile, for example? Are they less of a woman? You see, womanhood is not a single experience. A white woman will never go through the same exact experiences as a black woman. A woman born into poverty will never know what it's like to have a childhood in the upper class. A straight woman doesn't know what it's like to be a bisexual woman or a lesbian. 
A cis woman born infertile will not know what it's like to be pregnant, nor will a fertile cis woman know what it's like to be known that you are infertile from birth. Yet we never question the validity of any of these different types of womanhood, or at least we shouldn't. So why is it so hard to believe that trans and cis womanhood experiences, while different, are not irreconcilable with the idea of being a woman in a broad sense? There are many trans women exclusive experiences that cis women will never have. Womanhood is, as we said, a made up construct. It is more useful to talk about and fight for abortions and reproductive health care rights on the terms of getting it for those who need it. A fight that trans women have long been allies in, by the way, even if we haven't been the direct recipients or beneficiaries of it. Because access to affirming health care is an issue that face trans people as well, and fighting for women's access to have their own bodily autonomy respected in health care issues, regardless if they directly affect trans people, will affect trans people and anybody that has to face these issues. And the fact that TERFs are willing to align themselves with groups like the Heritage Foundation, which argues against women's reproductive rights, showcases that caring about reproductive rights, like TERFs argue that they're going for, isn't really their goal. It isn't really what they're trying to do. TERFs are more than happy to be tokens for right-wing conservative groups who wish to limit women's health care and reproductive rights. So, if they are willing to ally with people who fight against women bodily autonomy, we can see that their goal isn't to fight for women's bodily autonomy. It isn't about fighting for access to healthcare or reproductive rights, or to fight against the stereotyping of women. So, if it's not any of that, what is it actually about? Well, it's about attacking trans people, plain and simple, to put down transgender people. Again, I go back to that quote from the transsexual empire. Their express goal is to focus on transgender people to legislate against us. That is their number one goal. But why? Why? Why is that the goal? Because it would just be stupid of me to end there and just say TERFs are like some villain who only exists to harm transgender people who are some like primordial evil monster. Why do they attack transgender people specifically? Well, the reason is TERFs frame their womanhood and their sense of self and identity as victimhood. It's right up there at the top. All women are oppressed. But they take that as their core identifier with their own identity. They take the identifier of victim. You see, while feminism and radical feminism as a whole discuss how women are harmed by the patriarchy, they also frame it as a fight in which women have agency to fight back. We may live in a system where women are oppressed, but we can fight that system. That the job of feminism is to push forward and fight it. It doesn't frame the entirety of women's identity as a victim. That's just a distinguisher. But to TERFs, they are only and solely see themselves as victims. And this, sadly, often comes out of trauma, out of a traumatic experience in their life. Look at pretty much any argumentation from TERFs, and whenever they talk about themselves and their reasons for being worried about the trans agenda, they'll often cite a specific traumatic experience in their life. I've been in the public eye for over 20 years, and have never talked publicly about being a domestic abuse and sexual assault survivor. I'm mentioning these things now, not in an attempt to garner sympathy, but out of solidarity with the huge numbers of women who have histories like mine, who've been slurred as bigots for having concerns around single-sex spaces. I managed to escape my first violent marriage with some difficulty, but I'm now married to a truly good and principled man, safe and secure in ways I never in a million years expected to be. However, the scars left by violence and sexual assault don't disappear, no matter how loved you are, no matter how much money you've made. Not every single TERF has had a traumatic experience, but most do, and most of the arguments are framed that way. You'll often find discussions of sexual abuse, harassment, and sexual violence at the root of every single TERF's belief. They'll discuss how they've been victims of a form of assault, and sadly, because how women in general are treated in our society, that's all too common. One in three women, regardless if they're trans or not, have been victims of some sort of sexual assault or abuse. And believe me, believe me, I understand what it's like to go through trauma and only be able to see yourself as the victim after that event. To only be able to understand who you are as someone who has been irrevocably harmed. I've discussed in many of my other videos that I've done on trauma about how it causes you to lose pillars of identity, to lose pillars of self. It makes you feel like you don't have agency in your own life anymore. 
and TERFs feel this inherent loss of agency through trauma and attempt to find control, to gain stability. That is one of the things that we all try to do after a traumatic event. When we go through a trauma, we need to reorient ourselves in our lives to feel like we have agency in our life again because our agency was taken away from us. TERFs as radical feminists inherently understand this, and they know to fight the patriarchy is a long, hard battle, one that really won't be won in our lifetimes. It's a project that will take generations and numerous wins and losses to fight. That's the story of feminism, generational battle after generational battle. So, when faced with that and having that knowledge, it's understandable that someone who has been so traumatized, who feels the need for a sense of control, will reframe their worldview in order to have more agency. And TERFs do this by changing the definition of their oppression. They say that trans women are part of that oppressing class, that trans women are men. And because trans women are part of a marginalized group already, because trans folks have even less power and agency than white upper middle class women do, which is what most TERFs are, well, fighting trans people is a fight that TERFs can win. They can't always win a fight for abortion access, but they can win a fight to limit the rights of transgender people's access to healthcare. You see, they framed their battle in a way that they feel like they are winning, that they are fighting back against their oppressors, against the patriarchy in a way. They do it so they have that sense of control, that they have that sense of framing their life as something that they can fight back against. And I understand that. I know what it is like to be abused, to be a victim, to be harassed. I've also seen friends of mine, trans and cis, who have suffered horribly as the victims of sexual abuse, rape, and assault. So believe me when I say I understand deeply the need and desire to control your life again, to find a way to reframe your life as something that is able to push forward. But lashing out at a marginalized group isn't the way to do that. You don't get to use your pain as someone who has suffered trauma as a weapon against an even more marginalized group. So while TERFs have my pity, they also have my anger. I can empathize with them, but I can only extend that empathy so far. It ends the moment you lash out at someone. Abuse begets abuse. The cycle perpetuates itself, but that doesn't mean you are let off the hook. It does not mean that we have to accept it or allow it, even if we understand it. So. Um, this part of the video is something I've decided to add uh, several months after I finished writing the rest of the video and actually several weeks after I filmed the rest of the video because now that I've had some distance from every other part of this video and I've sort of sat with it and edited it and kind of looked at the totality of it, I realized that there was a piece of this story about TERFs that was missing and one that I could only really wrestle with now that I've had a little bit of distance from kind of thinking about it all the time. And the reason for that is writing this video was really hard. While I tried to make it fun and enjoyable and have some jokes in there and make it entertaining for everybody, I think I would be remiss if I didn't share how really hard this video was to make. I talked about in other sections of this video how TERFs are incredibly dogmatic in their focus on attacking trans people specifically. And to do this video, I had to do a ton of research into that aspect of it to kind of look at it to be able to talk about it coherently. And I had to do it both in a general way and in a specific way. I've been doing trans videos and trans topic discussions for many years now, going back to when I used to work at an LGBTQ magazine called The Advocate. And for this video, I went back and looked at some of the things that were said about some of the articles that I wrote there by TERFs. I even found a Tumblr um, chat that was just expressly making fun of me for being trans, calling me he, calling me ugly. And then I also had to look at the horrible things that TERFs has said about other trans people. And I have made no bones about the fact that I am proud to be transgender. I am never going to be made to feel bad for being trans. But looking at that over and over and over again, it takes its toll on your mental health. I broke down 
several times while writing this video. You know, I sit right here, this is my computer right here, and, you know, I would sit away typing, and then I would go into my room over there and break down and cry because I feel like I wasn't doing good enough because I wasn't expressing how important this topic is to trans people because TERFs are hard. They're really hard to talk about because as I've shared in this video, I understand, I understand so much the pain that they go through and why they're feeling the way that they do. And I want to empathize that with that, but it's also hard to empathize with someone who hurts you so directly and targetedly. It's almost like being hurt by a friend rather than someone you expect to hurt you. It's why JK Rowling coming out against trans people was so harmful for so many trans people because we viewed JK Rowling as a friend, as someone who cared about these issues, who should have understood the pain that we went through. And so it's so hard to look at people who should understand your struggles and whose struggles do you understand and see them come back and attack you. And I don't just say that as like a personal thing, but I, I feel it for all the trans people who have to face this even harder than I do. Now, I'm somewhat distanced from it being in a, you know, privileged place of where I live in my economic background and access to different healthcare options that I have. But many trans people who face uh, TERFs and who TERFs target their rights of uh, don't have that. And the reason that I share this part of this story of making this video is not to garner sympathy from all of you, but I think it goes to the reason that I made this video in the first place. Because I want all of you to know how important it is that we have allies in this fight who understand what this discussion when it comes to TERFs is about what it means. As I said before, TERFs are so good at hiding what they have to say under things that seem reasonable and understandable. But it is so expressly harmful and painful and targeted at trans people. And we need allies who will stand up for us because this type of discussion takes so much energy for every trans person having this discussion. We need people who can fight alongside us to push back, can push back against this ideology because it hurts us so expressly, but we don't always have the energy to be able to fight back. And so we need allies on our side who understand. And so if you are not a trans person who is watching this video, and, I, and who I hope this video has helped you understand a little bit of a kernel of why this discussion is so important. I ask you that you need to stand with trans people. You need to put your voice next to ours to give us support and give us your strength because we don't always have that. We need people to help lift us up when we have to face the brunt of this attack over and over and over again. And that was something that I really kind of could only really express once I was out of the fog of making this video. And so I just wanted to share that with all of you right now. At the end of the day, the real issue that frustrates me with TERFs is that they distract from the real fight. TERFs are so close to understanding. They get the power structures at play and how women are harmed, but they take the easy road in order to feel powerful, like they have agency in a fight that we are all fighting regardless. As I said, the real fight is against how society limits the agency of women. How women, both trans and cis, are mistreated because we are women. As well as how trans people, man, woman, or non-binary, are hurt for being transgender, as well as many other marginalized identities. But to fight against that, as I said, is a long fight. 
As sad as it is to say, we won't win that fight in our lifetimes. It will be a long, hard, painful road. But we need to fight it. As many of you know on this channel, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I mean, I make no bones about that. I even got Seven of Nine sitting right here. I love to believe in that world where we are all equal and have equal agency in deciding our own futures. But we all need to push for that type of future together. And also, sadly, we probably won't live to see it, but I want to be part of making it possible. But I've had to spend my time and energy that I could have used doing something else writing this video, breaking down how two oppressed minorities, women who subscribe to chirp ideology and trans people, are fighting each other. I'd rather have used this time to make a video about abortion rights, or trans issues, or queer issues, or women's issues in general, or something like that. We shouldn't frame the fight as cis women versus trans women because that's not the issue. Women, all women, cis or trans, as well as all transgender folks, LGBTQ folks, all marginalized groups and our allies should fight together against those who perpetuate a system that harms us. That this fight is something used by those really in power to profit and hold on to that power. When trans women and TERFs fight each other, neither side wins. Feminism doesn't win. We just all lose. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching this video. Like I said, this video was a lot of hard work and honestly, a lot of emotional labor. For any trans person, it is really, really hard to discuss terse because it can get so incendiary and can get so harmful to just even think about and talk about because it is so directly harmful to trans people as a group. Um, and also because when you look at TERFs, they are so dogmatic against trans people. I am not going to be surprised if the comments in this video get incredibly toxic. So I will say this right up front. Please try to keep the comments constructive. Please try to talk to people in good faith. And any comments that get insulting or transphobic expressly, like if someone accidentally is transphobic or says something incorrectly, I totally want this to be a safe space for that. But if someone says something insulting or directly cruelly transphobic, it will be deleted. I'm just saying that because I want to try to make this as safe a space as possible to have actual nuanced discussion, but critical discussion where we engage with each other and also engage with me. Because if I screw things up, uh, if I got something wrong or misrepresented something, I wanna hear it. I wanna hear your criticism because again, nuance does not mean that I'm the only one that is the queen of nuance and I'm the only one that can understand nuance. No, it means understanding nuance means that I'm going to get things wrong and we can talk about the nuances of that. So I want to hear all of that down in the comments below. Also, like I said earlier, doing videos like this, doing all this research and taking this time to edit it and make it and set up the cool little lighting things and doing all the costumes and stuff that takes a lot of time um, and energy. And I do have a full-time job on top of this, but I am aiming to do this full-time and to be able to do more and bigger stuff on this channel. So if you want to support that, Patreon is the place to do it. You get yourself cool perks like your name and videos and it really means a lot to me. And there's also a cool community over there on the Discord server full of really wonderful people that do Star Trek watch alongs each and every week or actually sometimes several times a week. So it's really a beautiful community that I would really love to have you be a part of. Um, but beyond all of that, don't forget to subscribe and thank you so much for watching this and I hope it was informative and helpful. Um, or you hated it and you moved on and that's totally okay too. But regardless of if you hated my work, if you like this video, any of or anything in between all of that, I just hope that you as always live long and prosper. Right, Seven? Seven says that too. And good. Ha huh, ha, huh. here we go. So I'm finally here performing for you. If you know the words, you can join in too. Put your hands together if you want to clap as I thank you all with this patron rap. Huh, Catherine Lambeth, Miranda Janelle, Ashley Allen, Bo Kikio, Eli Bergmas, 
Aslan Solstice, John Cool, Greg Gillum, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Felicia Toast, Wellington Marcus, Boyd Earl and Mary Beth Earl, Stephen Schuhart, Wayne Twitchell, Corey Honkinen, and Vale Dunn, A Man Chooses a Slave Obeys, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, Buttoneer, John Steele, what does God need with a starship? Michael Beam, Meadow Whisperer, William Steele, Chamomile Tea, BBD, Moonir Amlani, Jason Knott, John Weatherby, Maeve Liama, Bree Beecher, Andrew K, Nathan Steele, Sky Skinner, Sean Piper, Flynn, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Tiffany Danger, Cast the Last, Laura Dermero, Geek Filter, Mari Neckar, Troy Stull, Gretchen Badger, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Bush, Jane Packard, James Crivda, Din W. Randy E. D. Ellie O'Dare, John H. McDougal, Celestial John, Jacob Tovar, Sarah Bystam, Jessica Chapman, Lysa, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Polly Mina, Andrew Lamoro, Jennifer Fuss, Zone One Librarian, Jenny Mabel, and Michael Hardy. Thank you so much. I hope you appreciate me being a dorky weirdo that's totally off key with any sort of beat, but thank you so much, patrons. I love you all.